Let's use the internal affairs process for what it's for. Use it when appropriate, don't use it when it's not appropriate. The minute we crush that spirit, they stop doing those things. Yeah. They stop hunting down criminals. They stop being proactive with car stops. Welcome back to Internal Affairs, a police podcast. Scott Savage will be in the studio. A friend, a colleague, my man, my ace, and more important, uh, I work for, uh, for Scott Savage for Savage Training Group. Look, you're going to hear a really good story uh, f- uh, anywhere from, uh, let's see, he went to uh, Palo Alto PD, stayed there for a couple of years, and then next thing you know, uh, he goes to Santa Clara PD and just retired about a year ago. You got to hear his story. And uh, we're going to have a little good conversation with the boss. So stay tuned and we'll see you soon. Okay, we're back. Code 6 with Scott Savage. Bro, you know what? Uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, considering uh, you hired me uh, uh, to do the internal affairs investigation course along with the Oscar involved shooting and uh, kind of looking forward to... Uh, getting to know you a little bit better. And I'm sure uh, we can agree that every one of us have an Aya story. Uh, don't, you'll share it with us. And uh, thanks for coming, bro. No, thanks for having me. You know, when yeah. you first said you were going to launch an IA podcast, I was very supportive, I think. But then, no, really what I thought was you're nuts. You're absolutely nuts. Who in the world is going to want to come talk about this stuff? But you've done such a great job with it. Um, it's amazing. Thank you, because uh, you were the one that told me, hey, uh, Clarity wins. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, well, let me give it a fancy name uh, or whatever. And then I said, you know what? Let's just call yeah. it exactly what it is. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you and I can agree, uh, and we'll go through you know, a trip down memory lane, if you will, where we start talking about uh, a topic uh, that is a bit taboo. No one wants to talk about internal affairs. Uh, in fact, when we met, uh, it, it seems as though it's with an untapped subject. And for whatever reason... Uh, people just, uh, I suppose, don't like to air out their dirty laundry. So I guess my first question to you is, why is it that you think that uh, people have not a hard time, but they struggle with some disciplinary issues and they don't like talking about them? What's your thoughts about that? I think it's really simple to understand. A lot of agencies weaponize the internal affairs process. So if you're uh, I think myself included, I want my local police department to be above board. I want them to have, you know, do the right thing. And if something goes wrong, I want that local agency to investigate it and handle it. Uh, of course, you know, nobody wants to work with rotten cops. There's plenty of rotten cops out there. Let's get rid of them. The issue becomes, though, is that some agencies are weaponizing it and using the internal affairs process to fix things like morale issues, leadership issues, lack of supervision, and hey, we don't like this guy, so we're going to go after him. And, you know, and listen, I've been on the receiving end of that. It doesn't feel very good. Uh, and it's, not, it's not a lot of fun. But I just think, you know, over time, you know, I, I retired with 24 years on. Uh, over time, you've been through those things enough. It hurts your feelings. It doesn't feel good to be called a liar, a racist. If you're violent, you did this, you did that. Those things take a toll. And, and we hire police officers from the human race. They have human emotions. So especially if you're a good dude, yeah. like you're an upstanding citizen, you're an upstanding cop and you get accused of stuff, it doesn't feel very good. So they don't want to talk about it. No, absolutely. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> when you came on the job in July of 1999, mm-hmm. uh, 24 plus years ago, mm-hmm. uh, what was your first impression? So here in the academy, and I suppose in the academy, you probably didn't know much about internal affairs, but here you are as a probationary officer. What did anyone tell you about IA or what was the impression you got by your training officers or whomever about internal affairs? I don't remember it ever being mentioned. And all I know is you didn't want anything to do with it. But, you know, I, unlike you, I worked at a small agency. And it's not like we had an internal affairs division, an internal affairs department. It was whatever sergeant or lieutenant happened to be working that, they're going to go investigate that. And uh, I didn't really think too much about it. I just knew, gosh, that's not something I want to be involved with. And the first time I ever heard anything about this was when I was served as a subject officer with a paper saying, you've been accused of this. You've got an interview at this date at this time. And I thought, you know, dear God, like, I'm going to get fired. And it, it was a big nothing. But I'm just like, it's a very scary process. And these things, even if it's a nothing complaint, run out for months. Yeah. And the whole time you're there thinking, oh, I must, 
you know, I must have killed somebody's cat or something like that. It, you feel like you are the suspect kind of thing. So um, that was my first experience with it. Uh, you own Savage Training Group. We'll get into that mm -hmm. a little later. Uh, uh, let me ask you this. If you're in a room full of sergeants that are beginning uh, an assignment in internal affairs, what's the one thing you want them to know about that job? Uh, be a dispassionate investigator. And, and by dispassionate, I don't mean don't have passion for your job. Don't be you know, enthusiastic. But when you're going to do an internal affairs investigation, whether you work the unit like you did or you're a sergeant like I was and you have collateral obligations to conduct preliminary internal affairs investigations, do so dispassionately, irrespective of who you're in, who's being investigated, whether you like or dislike this person. Um, and if the person who comes through the door who says, hey, Sarge, you know, this employee did X, you don't care for them. They're not a very likable person. Maybe they're rude. They're, let's just be dispassionate towards that. As well. Let's take in the information and let's go and interview the person, get the facts, do all that. But let's not look at it like, yeah, we finally get to get that officer. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. like I did when I was first a sergeant, people would call and say, I want to you know, complain about an officer. They say, hey, sergeant, you have a call on line one. I'd pick it up and I'd be listening to it thinking, this is nonsense, right? One guy said, I saw a cop go by and he was on his phone. And that's not right because there's a new law that says you can't be on your phone when you're driving. And I thought, aha, it is a law enforcement exemption. It says you can be on your phone if you're an on-duty police. And I start telling this guy the law, right? And going, you don't get it, man. We got a hard job. Like being a cop is, that's not what he wanted, man. He wanted to be heard. By the end of the conversation, which I thought was my job to defend the cop, by the end of the conversation, he goes, I want to complain about you too. <laughs> Give me your lieutenant. And I'm like, well, fine, lieutenant, call line one. You know, that's not really the job that you're supposed to be doing. So dispassionate, chill out, take in the information. Let's go down the road. Let's get all the facts. Whether we like the officer, don't like the officer. Whether we like the reporting party, don't like the reporting party. Let's dispassionately get to the truth. That's what I would tell them. Yeah, good, man. Thanks. I appreciate that. Look, uh, let's take a trip down memory lane. We're there now where uh, you were in the academy in July of 1999, but uh, people don't know that you were a paramedic mm. uh, before you came on the job. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after teaching today, we were thinking to ourselves, you know, maybe we should have been firefighters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> With yeah. all the laws and everything that's going on. Man, I think you're right. I think I always, like, make the joke, do you think firefighters sit around and think about all these laws and problems and lawsuits and internal affairs? I don't. I think they sit in their station and work on their turducken recipe, hashtag turducken, look it up, and try to figure out how to run their realty business. In other words, they're happy, right? Yeah. Cops, like, we're worried about all this stuff that's going on. Um, but, yeah, before I was a police officer, I was a paramedic. Before that, I was an EMT. So since 19 years old, all I've ever done is work in emergency services. I don't know how to do anything else, yeah. right? And I love it. And I loved being a paramedic, but... Uh, I was a paramedic in San Jose, uh, California, very busy EMS system, and it was awesome, but it was also the time when fire departments started providing paramedic service, right. and, and I didn't really want to sit around and watch other people do it, so I started looking for what's a career that's similar, it's uh, noble, it's something you can be proud of, it's physically challenging, intellectually challenging, and it was being a police officer is what I selected. That's good, man. So here we are, the Academy, July 1999, uh, congratulations. Uh, uh, Y2K, uh, yeah. you went out in the streets, man. Uh, they said the world, <laughs> hey, congratulations, you're a cop. The world is literally going to come to an end. You're going to be on a strike team. I'm like not even off FTO. Uh, what's a strike team? <laughs> I don't even know how to put this gear on. And uh, they're like, just get ready. It's going to be riots in the streets. Y2K, if you don't know, was when 2000 hit, they said the world was going to come to an end. Right. Obviously, nothing happened. <laughs> At Palo Alto, is that correct? Yeah, I was in Palo Alto, California. That's where Stanford is. Um, that's like right in the middle of Silicon Valley. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, we did 18 years. And now in those 18 years, uh, congratulations, you get promoted to sergeant in uh, around yeah. 2010. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you spent quite some time uh, being a sergeant. And yeah. you, know, you and I were talking uh, before we started recording about that job of a sergeant. What do you think uh, was so challenging for you as a sergeant back then to what it is today? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, being a sergeant, especially a sergeant on patrol, every cop I ever talked to says that's the best job in the department. A sergeant on patrol, you have so much influence, right? Um, it's a very interesting position because one day you're an officer, you're eating with the 
your friends, everyone's, you're just kind of want to appear. And then the very next day, you're a sergeant and everyone's kind of like, no, thanks. I don't really want to go to lunch with you. Right. And for, you know, in California, especially, there's not great training for when you become a sergeant. So um, you're kind of thrown to the wolves and there's a lot riding on you. And in my jurisdiction, gosh, in the middle of the night, you were the highest ranking city official on duty in the city. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. Yeah. Right. And so biggest thing I say about being a sergeant is when you tell officers to go do your bidding, hey, go through that door, go make entry, go through that door, and they're going to do it. You know, and you better be right. Yeah. You better be tactically proficient, knowledge of the law, knowledge of policies, because officers will do what you say. You better be right. Is that where, uh, when you made sergeant, uh, is that where you got kind of like the itch or like this light bulb about training? Because mm -hmm. you felt perhaps... Uh, training is uh, very uh, insufficient, if you will. Yeah, I love training. I've always loved training even before I was a cop and I was a paramedic. I was involved in teaching at paramedic schools and all, and being an FTO and a preceptor right. and all this stuff. And I always loved training even when I became a cop. But then when I became a sergeant and I saw what was available, I, I went to the two-week sergeant school, which I know you went to two-week plus additional. Yes. And we... Uh, Every cop I meet has similar thoughts about how that those courses go. Totally insufficient. Did you know in 80 hours of being a police and at police sergeant school, we discussed being in the field zero times, like responding to an officer involved shooting, responding to a hot call, what to do during a pursuit. I mean, the things that can get people killed. Yeah. We discussed those zero times. And what we did discuss was the difference between generation Y and X and Z and all this stuff that you can Google. It's not what we need to be spending time doing in this class. So I started thinking, man, if I was going to do this, how would I teach myself how to run hot calls? What do I know from SWAT? What do I know from the National Tactical Officers Association? What do I know from my peers, from my reading, from my study? Could I put together a class? And that was the genesis of this first class I wrote. And it kind of just snowballed years and years later, started yeah. the company, Savage Trading Group. And and uh, we still teach a version of that original course. So. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just that. Uh, so, so what was uh, funner, the forty-hour uh, first aid uh, course that you had, uh, or was oh, it yeah. the uh, supervisor? Which one did you enjoy? Yes, I I <laughs> told you that no matter what story you tell about training, I can beat you. I attended a forty-hour <laughs> post-certified first aid instructor school, which I I wanted to eat my gun about the first half of the first day it was horrendous right especially coming from being a paramedic because you're like everything that was being said was the sanitized version of you know the people that have heart attacks always have these symptoms and i was thinking no they don't people that do this I don't, no they don't you got to get the compressions the ventilations right do you know what it doesn't really matter you know if you do five to one six to two it's not <laughs> this dude's dead like he's not gonna get any dead or bro and so it was awful it was awful but um but that she thought one it was the best. Yes, yeah, the instructor did. Please don't be listening to this podcast, <laughs> right? Uh, they, the instructor thought it was the most important thing, and so we just said thank you so much for my which, certificate. Which, which it is, right. by, by no means. Sure, we're absolutely. all we're doing is just being a little critical about right. the hours. Right, 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 right. The right. fact that we were there for forty hours. That's right. Yeah, and perhaps maybe the class, maybe it isn't forty hours. I don't. Know. I don't know. Uh, 2017, we said goodbye. Yeah. To Palo Alto and. Uh, now we go to Santa Clara, yeah, uh, PD, where the San Francisco 49ers play. That's right. And San Francisco, out of curiosity, how far is San Francisco from Santa Clara? I've always just, I've just been dying to ask. Because mm. Los Angeles Dodgers yes. is actually in Los Angeles. Yes, it makes absolutely no sense. So, yeah, I worked my last six years as a law enforcement officer for the city of Santa Clara. Wonderful agency. I loved every minute of it. I couldn't say enough about it. The 49ers play in Levi Stadium in the city of Santa Clara. We're the smallest agency with a national uh, or with a, a major, you know, stadium in yeah. it. And why the San Francisco 49ers play 40 to 50 miles south <laughs> of San Francisco in a small town called Santa Clara? We I don't know. know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, but they do. They're there. And uh, yeah, that's that's what we did. Yeah, we we just, worked uh, the games and yeah, the whole thing. What was that like? Uh, what kind of assignments? Uh, what, if you were to look back in your career, I know, congratulations, you've yeah. been retired for a year now. If you were to just kind of, um, you know, roll back the uh, memory, uh, what stands out in Santa Clara? 
Uh, Santa Clara was a great agency. I, you know, honestly, went from being a supervisor at my previous agency to mm -hmm. starting over in patrol as a, a new guy, right? right? And so you're, I remember the first big incident I went on this big melee. I was used to being a sergeant, being, you know, having that 10,000 foot view, being removed, having, being back at my CP at my truck or something like that. And I had to remember, okay, what do we do? Well, I got to grab this guy and we got to get, why is this guy's hands in his pockets? I got to run that, you know, it was going back to being the operator again, but um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I had a blast. It was, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, July, 2023. Uh, Welcome to the fifties club. Thank you. And, uh, and retired. Yes, sir. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, got to watch you perform. I know not many people know that you're a big time drummer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had no clue. Yeah. Uh, a kid like me from uh, born and raised in Peru who came here in 1980 uh, fell in love with uh, Rush, uh, and we used to have these talks between Rush and Van Halen, who's better. Well, wait a minute, John Bonham's a better drummer than Neil Peart. Yeah. Uh, and I know that uh, here I am reliving uh, meeting you because I know yeah. you're a big uh, Neil Peart fan and a Rush fan. Huge Rush fan. Um, if you've got logos right now, put them up with a bunch of Rush stuff. We will. And yeah, perfect. We'll pop them up. Perfect. Yeah, big Rush fan. Big. Been playing uh, musician or been playing drums since I was a, uh, in eighth grade. So it's been just a lifelong passion of mine. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's good to know. Well, hey, we're at the uh, segment where uh, you get to tell us uh, an I story. Uh, I, I know you and I kind of uh, bounce back, whether it's uh, something that you experienced uh, or, or uh, something along the lines that hey, uh, maybe things could have gone different. And like anything, uh, as long as we can get some takeaways and some lessons learned, man. Uh, what do you got? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think that I was thinking about this. I knew you were going to ask. Obviously, that's what the show's about. And, you know, I could share, you know, internal affairs investigations I've been involved with as a subject officer, I meaning where they're looking at me when there's been an allegation of misconduct or ones that I've uh, supervised, you know, as a patrol sergeant right. doing the intake on or just, you know, being involved in that stuff. I was a union president for a, a short period of time. It was awful. And, you know, obviously was privy to a lot of the stuff that was going on but just to give you kind of the high level view i would say that something the viewers may not be aware of is that a lot of agencies use that internal affairs process to kind of do their bidding right they weaponize it give you an example uh until the time i became the union president i don't think i was ever the subject of an internally generated misconduct allegation mm -hmm. right yeah, there's citizen complaints. And if you're if you're a cop for any period of time, people are going to complain about you. And if they're not complaining about you, what are you doing all day long, right? If you're doing police work, you're going to get complained about. But, you know, I'd be promoted to sergeant. And then shortly after, I became the union president. And shockingly, I started getting, I became the subject of internally generated internal affairs complaints. One was, you know, I'm sick at home. And I was like, uh, I, I wake up, I'm supposed to go to swing shift that evening. And I go, man, I'm not feeling well. I know what I'll do because I know staffing screwed up. I'll call my corporal and be like, can you fill in for me? And then I'll call another officer and be like, can you fill in for that corporal? And I thought I'm going to do, as opposed to just calling and being like, I'm sick. Screw you guys. Yeah. I tried to fill, you know, the positions there. But then, so that was one allegation. You violated the overtime call up procedure even though we all know no one's going to pick up the phone when I call them to come in for this thing. Right. Let's just skip to the chase and call the guy who actually comes in. Right. No, 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 no. You got to go through the... Oh, uh. Okay. The other one was we had a time card system where you had to fill out your time card two weeks in advance and say, I worked next Tuesday from 1400 to 0100. And why'd you have to do that? Because the system says you have to do that. And I thought, I asked before, isn't this time card fraud? Shut up, Scott. Oh, okay. So anyway, I had already filled out my time card, but see, when I got back after calling in sick, I didn't change it from straight time to sick time. So this one lieutenant said, we got, got him, him, boys. We got him. Oh, Ring a bell. Me. Oh, they thought they really, he went on a absolute investigation of my time cards. And I think they found one other time when he did it and they said, we got him. We got him. And very serious allegations, time card fraud, which by the way, I would have yes. been fired for mm -hmm. had that been proven. Thank the good Lord, after a many month investigation, a more level headed person who wasn't vindictive got a hold of this, did the IA investigation, and wrote Sergeant Savage really doesn't have a motive to do something like this. The guy's got 600 hours of sick time and 600 hours of vacation on the books. Why would he do that? Right? 
<sighs> that was one, and there were many silly things like it. Not silly to go through. Yeah. It's actually one of the reasons that I needed to make a change and go to a different agency. But I'll tell you another one that was very interesting that people may be like, what? You tell me what you would do. You were a sergeant. You tell me what you would do. Okay. okay? Call comes out on one side of town. An officer makes a car stop. Gets the guy's license back. He's talking to the violator. Maybe goes back to his car or whatever. All of a sudden, radio comes back and says, that plate is 10851. That's the code for stolen car. Stolen vehicle. Officer pulls out his gun. Oh, okay. We got a stolen car here. The crook kind of figures out, oh, I think the gig is up. You know what? I'm going to try to get out of here. Puts it in reverse floors it towards the officer officer jumps in his car bad guy hits the front door or the you know driver's side door slams the door shut would have taken off the cop's legs thank god he you know he got into the car real quick puts out hey you know code three cover 245 on an officer a couple more cops get behind the bad guy's car and the chase is on well across town a very new very well-meaning god bless him officer very rookie Here's this call, code three cover, 245 an officer, and goes, oh, God, this it's, it. it's the big one, right? Yes. Puts that baby in gear. It's my career. Oh, yeah. Best I got to get there. I got to get there. God bless him. You got to help my partner. Puts that thing in the gear and goes Mach 14 down a 25-mile-an-hour street. Where maybe or maybe not the speeds may be calculated later. Oh, I think the, the camera comes on when you hit 80. Okay. Oh, my Is God. like bumps? I don't know. Spark Very populated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Populated like restaurants, moms, strollers, not at night. Oh, God. All bad. They get the guy in custody. Great. Because the car camera came on, somebody, some lieutenant got the, you know, notification. Oh. We got him. They investigate him and say, this kid's doing 80 and a 25, which is bad. This yes. is horrible. Yes. How could this be handled as a sergeant? I mean, there's some accountability. Just, you know, hey, man, you know what? Look, dude, just uh, slow down. Yes. <laughs> Listen, son. Let's just talk to him. Let's talk to Let's him. Let's talk to this kid. And son, just we come. appreciate you. How your, many years do you have on? Uh, zero, like one. Oh, my God. Poor thing. He's, yeah. He's thinking this is the crime of the century. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I put my Superman cape. Absolutely. And I'm going, oh, my God, I got to help. Yeah. <sighs> but let's get him in and let's be like, hey, man, appreciate your enthusiasm. Yeah. We yeah. And we love you for... Yeah. running to the hot call because did you know some officers may go the opposite direction yeah and they may be like sixth seventh eighth on scene kind of guy you said no way i'm gonna go help my partner we appreciate that now i'm, I'm dying to know <laughs> yeah but now let, let's do let's slow down that's not what happened <laughs> they put this kid on a year long performance improvement plan which included i think four rides four different shifts with a driving instructor What's, okay. Don't yeah. know what that's going to yeah. do. Who is that? I don't know. Some driving uh, Evoc instructor. He's going to sit there and, and then tell you, and tell you, good yeah. job. Good. <laughs> and then the sergeant who he come to my team and they go, here's your, his PIP, his performance improvement plan. You got to watch and audit his car camera videos to make sure he's driving good. What do you think this kid did? He drove the speed limit, every call to everywhere. Oh. And his yeah. spirit was crushed. Yes. That young man lateral to another agency. Yeah. Yeah. We can't we can't penalize, over penalize. Let's have some some supervision, maybe some counseling. Yeah. Hey, you know, that good old saying that I always say, you know, the punishment's not the penalty, the punishment is the process. And it goes to show you that it's uh, you know, we, we do it to ourselves. We 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 eat our own and the treatment is certainly and and the crappiest part about this example is uh, that's a small agency. And that sticks out like everybody knows, right? Yeah. Compared to a big machine like myself and uh, my beloved LAPD. Yeah, I mean, if it happens in, I don't know, one division in the Valley of Devonshire, no one from South LA, whether it's the mothership 77, Southeast or South, no one's going to know. Right. You know, and then you move on. But yeah, man, that's, uh, that's uh, crushing spirit is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, anything else that kind of still got, was that something like, kind of started making you feel like, uh, I don't know about this. Yeah, you know, I started as a sergeant. You have to start now getting involved in that. And every police agency, there's something like 18,000 police agencies in America. Each one has their own culture, yeah. their own way of doing things. And the average police agency size is like 30 officers, mm -hmm. right? It, it's crazy. So each one of those has their own culture. The culture of the agency I was working with started to not align with my own vision or mission, or however you want to uh, do it. 
And I started as a supervisor having to be involved in these types of things. And I don't, I think if a cop is making a mistake of the, the heart yes. or the mind or whatever yeah. one, the one where they meant to do it, yeah. let's have some serious consequences. But if this is a, a you know, where officers are trying to do the right thing, yeah. maybe they're a little misguided. I don't know that we need to have a full-blown internal affairs investigation, <sighs> skelly hearings. Dis I don't know that that needs to be there. Full-blown. Full-blown. Yeah. So that, that was one of the reasons that I think, you know, I, I think I need to make a change and go work for an agency that more aligns with um, my values. Not that it was a perfect agency, but um, I think the big takeaway from that for me is we ask police officers to do a very difficult job. Mm -hmm. And most of what they do that we ask them to do, such as go through the door and face danger, rush into an active shooter, yeah. most of it, they don't have to do it, meaning legally obligated yeah. to do it. Right, right. They do it because they're imbued with a spirit of, of doing those things. The minute we crush that spirit, they stop doing those things. Yeah. They stop hunting down criminals. They stop being proactive with car stops. They may stop rushing into danger. We, we won't like the, what happens when we do that. Yeah. And if you crush the spirit of police officers, they'll do one of two things. They'll leave and lateral out, which causes a recruitment and a retainment yeah, issue. Or worse, they'll stay yeah. and be 30 year yeah, salty, hate, it. Yeah. hate it, park under a shady tree, not go to call, be pissed off. Now you have a toxic employee. Let's use the internal affairs process for what it's for and not take it a little too far become the police of the police, weaponize it, use it when appropriate, don't use it when it's not appropriate. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it's kind of disheartening to know that, uh, like you said, each agency has their own culture when it comes to discipline. Let me ask you this, did you feel your time as a sergeant uh, that you were dealing with more internal disciplinary or employer related issues as opposed to operational tactical issues yes yeah i did it and it's funny a sergeant an old sergeant of mine told me a long time ago when i was brand new you are going to be more frustrated by what happens in this building yeah. versus what happens outside of this building because every police officer signed up to deal with crooks no problem like i, I don't have any problem with dealing with bad guys on the street what i don't expect is to be attacked in the building that i work yeah. what i don't expect is to have one set of rules for sort of the folks we like and maybe another set of rules for the folks we don't like. Yeah. Let, let's have a fair system, right? And, you know, dealing with stuff on the street, tactics, operations, man, that's the stuff we enjoy. Yeah. Like when suspects run, you're like, oh, awesome. You know, now we get to do all the tactical stuff. He's barricaded. Great. Now we get to do all the stuff that we rehearse to do. I didn't sign up to do, you know, internally generated yeah, totally. you know, stuff. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, I have been asking uh, my guests lately uh, this question. Uh, you know, I'll throw it out there to you uh, in your experience, especially as a sergeant, because, you know, you could be around lieutenants, captains, and command staff. Uh, do you think there is a double standard? Absolutely. You think that uh, double standard uh, impacts morale? Of course it does, and I, because I think if you have a fair one standard, in other words, promotions are based on what the promotional announcement says, which is these qualifications or whatever, or IAs are used just for this punishment for this particular offense is going to be the same no matter if it's Marlon or Scott doing it, right? Um, people can get behind that. It's just like the law. The law is supposed to be, you know, blind justice. Well, we want the same thing internally as well, and those that double standard is just a you're probably never going to get rid of it, right? Yeah. Um, 18,000 police agencies. Yeah, How do you fix all of that? You, you probably don't. we got a lot of work to do. And really, we're just like everyone else, right? We're just like uh, Google or, or some major company. You're going to have the same problems internally and the same stuff. It's yeah. just unfortunate that ours comes with very serious consequences. Roger that. Scott, give me a worst, worst incident that you experienced in your career. Hands down, it was a call that happened when I was a paramedic. Um, it was uh, a horrible call that I don't really love relating. It mm -hmm. dealt with children and a lot of children dying, mm -hmm. and it was an awful thing. I was a very young man. It happened on Christmas, and I swore off Christmas ever since, right? Um, but that was a long time ago when I was a paramedic. The, probably the worst call that I ever remember, that gut feeling, um, happened when I was a supervisor, uh, and it was because it was happening to someone else. I almost think... I knew this question was coming. 
And I almost think that if it had happened to me, I would have been more okay with it. Mm-hmm. But it was the that feeling of not being able to control it. And the call was, uh, we had just cleared patrol briefing and we had an on-duty workout. And I said, okay, I'll take the, I'm going to take that first hour because there's other sergeants on. So I'll just go do, do my thing. My guys will hit the streets without me. But there's other sergeants on. It's afternoon. Nothing's going to happen. Call comes out of a prowler in a yard. Guy's kind of going through a side yard, backyard during the day. And he just boot, he just ran out the side door. Now we got a call. He's in some downtown business and he's acting crazy. Hey, update. He just jumped through a second floor plate glass window. And now he's running down the street bleeding. So units are kind of going, we're thinking tweaker, you know, drugs, something yeah. like that. Well, one of the guys that he had just been working for me and he's now he's working for a new team. Great young, young officer. He goes, hey, I'm out with him. I see the guy. I'm out with him. And I'm in the gym, but I got my radio because I'm paranoid. And I'm kind of like half working out in gym clothes. And I hear, I'm listening to this. And I'm listening to silence. And he's not saying anything. And 60 seconds went by. And I knew this young man, I had said, anytime you go out on a hot call, within the first 60 seconds, I want to hear something from you. I'm out with him. He's cooperative. I'm out with him. He's not cooperative. He's fighting me. He's running. I have him in co- Whatever it is, give us an update. And if you don't give me an update, I'll know something's wrong. Yeah. And I swear to you, Marlon, I can feel it right now. The time is ticking by, and it goes around to that 60-second mark. I ran for the locker room, grabbed my gun belt and my vest in shorts and freaking, you know, T-shirt, yeah. run to my car and start code 3 it out to the scene. This kid's in a fight for his life. Bad guy has him on the ground, takes his gun, rips his holster off with a gun in it, and is trying to get his finger in the, the well of the gun to shoot it, but he can't because the piece of the holster, holster came off in it. His partner gets there and is trying to shoot the guy, but all he's seeing is cop, bad guy, cop, yeah. bad guy. Yeah. Eventually, they get the dude in custody. I run out there looking at it, just going, and I, my heart dropped because I'm like, dude, your young officers are out there. You're working out. Yeah. Your young officers are out there. You're not there to protect them. You know, I could have been a little bit closer and watching the video back, because they had great video of this happening, is just the, it, your heart sinks every time you see it. Worst feelings ever happened. God bless him. Now, they get the guy in custody. A local agency shows up and goes, we've been looking for that guy. He just did a homicide in San Jose, stabbed a transient. We've been looking for him for 24 hours. Uh, this was a dude that wanted to kill a cop. Yeah. And that was the worst, worst thing that's ever happened. But thanks... All the good guys are okay, so it's all good. Good, good. You know, I it, it almost makes me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can feel it, uh, you know, and, and visualize what you're going through, and there's just not enough. Uh, I'm sorry's, you yeah. know, that you can in your mind because this happened, you know, well over what 10, 15 years yep. ago, and mm. it's still. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, thinking about had I would have been out there, perhaps yep. none of this would have happened. And you're right, as a supervisor, your main responsibility. There's all these officers, man, and, yeah. you know, and, and I get it. I'd rather yeah. be me than you. Absolutely. Um, so, hey, thanks for sharing that. I sure. really appreciate that. Uh, well, now that we off on that bad note, I always like to leave on a good note. Give me something good, man. Give me, like, best achievement, yeah. uh, you know, best thing that's happened in your career that you can share. Nothing ever good happened. It all sucked. That's why I retired. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, the best uh, stop or I think I ever personally made, and I'll – I call it the rape that didn't happen. And uh, I was a brand new cop. I was working nights, driving around my little beat, my little sector, nothing going on, just cruising around, turned off my lights and was just cruising around with no lights on and these little like back streets and stuff like that, a little residential area. And I think for the first two nights of that week of shifts, nothing had happened, right? It's Mm -hmm. just like the town that crime forgot, man. It was just like slow and nothing's going down. And I remember that night I saw a dude walking I was like, that's interesting. But he really wasn't walking. He was lurking. And dude was like, it looked like a scenario. This guy was like peeking around corners and stuff. And I see him on the side of this apartment building. And he's kind of like looking in this, like getting close to this window, kind of not. And I'm like trying to be like, I'm in a freaking Crown Vic. I'm trying to be like invisible, you know, like (laughs) how close can I get to him? And he won't see me. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's this guy doing? And all of a sudden, dude sees me and he tries to like blend in. Uh Uh-huh. There's nobody else out there, dude. You don't blend, right? And so he's trying to like, oh, I'm just out for a jog. No, you're not. So I make the stop, put it out. I'm way far away from cover, and I'm by myself. I put the stop out, 
he's like, you know, he kind of like is looking around where he's going to run. I'm like, you thinking of running? Because I remember some academy instructor said, ask him, hey, are you thinking of running? <laughs> it like interrupts their freaking, they, oh, no. Their you, motor yeah, skills, whatever. Oodle loop. I thought, you think about running? He's like, no, I'm going to have a seat. So he sits down. He's like reaching around, looking around. I'm like, hey, get your hands in your pockets, all this stuff. Cover gets there. We get the guy cuffed up, start like searching him. On the outside, all black, black like jacket, black pants, black everything. Hot night. Pull off all that fully white clothing on the inside, white shirt, white pants, white everything. Full another set of clothing, not like underclothing, like another set of clothing. Wow. I'm like, why do you have two sets of clothing on? It's hot out. No reason. In uh, freaking in his pockets, condom and like some rope, like some twine or something like that. Okay. And then like a switchblade, a little knife. Knife, rope, condom, two sets of clothing. What are you doing around there? No business being around there. No, no, no criminal. We run him out. No criminal history. Nothing. This dude's a ghost. Where are you, why are you here? I was just out for a walk. No way. No way. And I, I will swear today that dude was going to break in someone's house. That was a rape about to happen, or he was getting the guts to do it, or he's going to rape his start with little prowls, and then they go to maybe they go in the house and look at the girl, and then eventually they rape it. And I'll never know. I'll never, there's no way of ever knowing. It's not like he copped anything or the, I'd love to tell you the detectives came in and we closed all these cases and it was like the big caper. It was a big nothing. But in my mind, I go, dude, I prevented that from being proactive, from being that cop, staying awake, not parking under a shady tree. You're out there looking for trouble. That's what we want cops doing. So to me, that that was the big one. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do we know if he was... One for anything, or uh, let's just edit this in and say he was, <laughs> dude. He was like Osama bin Laden's right hand man, terrorist watch list, dude. One eighty seven. Yeah, let's just edit that in and make sure. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, I'll, I know nothing note. about take that. Take note. That's yeah, great, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so uh, we're almost at the end of the segment here. Look, let's uh, let's just kind of talk a little bit about a Savage Training Group. I do know, uh, of course, I know you hired me. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. But uh, five years in the making, huh? Yeah, Savage Training, we, I launched it in 2019. It was just me and like one class. And then now, you know, we're up to 16 or 17 instructors, that many courses. Uh, of course, you know, we're based in California, but we teach all over the place. And it's a law enforcement training company. We do in-service training classes. We, we do private training courses. We're basically teaching police officers tactics, laws, uh, how to operate internal affairs investigations yeah. like, like you teach. We have a, a number of, of courses, and I really just launched the company wanting to be the best. I just want to be the best, right? And so we're, we're never going to get there, but we're on this mission to raise the bar of law enforcement training. And I, I think it's really a testament to instructors like you, like uh, your partner that teaches with you, like the rest of the folks we have. We have some uh, amazing, amazing human beings. So I actually brought you a gift. Oh. I actually brought you a little... Oh wow! Yeah, this because I know you're from Peru, and oh. I and I this little I know you take notes. I watch your show. Oh. I know you think I don't watch your show. Yeah, I do I watch your show, and you always take notes. But this little book says um, it says American grown with Peruvian roots. Oh man! And so that's a little book for you. And then hey, boss. And then this one is look at this. I just thought, man, I, I gotta get you like a little <laughs> yeah, bit something to put up. Look here. at I that. Oh, that. there you go. Mom is gonna love that. Yeah. Little Peru flag, a little wow. U.S. flag. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Wow. So wow. If it's, not, if it's not up here by the next episode, I'm gonna be <laughs> so upset. so upset. Yeah. No. no. No, I'm kidding. Congratulations. <laughs> this is an amazing thing you've done. It's really cool. Wow. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Uh, yeah. I know my mommy, todos mis amigos peruanos. Uh, you know, yeah. we're all uh, we're definitely. I I can't thank you enough. Yeah. Thank Look, you. Scott. Um, I'm gonna leave the floor up to you. Any advice you can give. Uh, anyone who's thinking about coming into law enforcement or even if it's a young officer listening or watching, a young sergeant that's trying to promote, an FTO, whomever is involved in law enforcement and or who's trying to get into law enforcement, uh, what advice would you give them, man? Uh, my advice is be a professional, right? And so with everything that that word means, be professional at everything you do. Um, that means in your appearance, right? That means staying in shape. That means the way you carry your uniform. That also means things like fighting and shooting. It's not just all, you know, peace and love with the job we have. If you're going to be fighting someone, do it professionally. Be really good at it. If you're going to shoot, be really, really good at it. Driving, 
the way you treat people, be a professional, something that you can be proud of. And so this job is extremely difficult. If you just want to go help people, there's plenty of other careers that you can quote, just help people. Um, this is an adversarial career and it's a very, very challenging career. And I don't have to tell you that. So I would say go into it with eyes wide open, be professional. As you become a sergeant, be a professional sergeant. Being a sergeant is not hard. No, it's only easy. It's only hard to do right. Yeah. So do it right. Like study harder than everyone else. Learn the tactics. Attend the training, whether it's our classes or something else. Read, read the books. Do all those things that it is to be a professional. No matter what you choose, be a professional. Hey man, look, I I will say this. There will never be enough thank yous from me to you for. Uh, we met, and you gave me an opportunity, and uh, we've just been hitting around, hitting the ground running. Um, I'm all in to uh, make this company grow. Uh, we're doing some really, really good stuff, and uh, it's not just coming from you know a boss to an instructor, but more than anything, I, I met a really good friend uh, that I'll take all the way to the grave, man. And I just yeah. uh, I can't thank you enough. Feelings mutual. Yeah, thank thanks, you for having brother. me. On that note, like always, please, please, please be safe and don't forget to go Code 6. Thank you.